It's happening. <laughs> I don't think I ever in my life have been in a room that's brimming with educators passionate about universal design for learning. That is. If I wasn't so jet, jet lagged, I think I'd shed a tear. Um, <laughs> but it's like half a beer and I'm like, you know, the cheapest date ever, really. Um, so I, I, did, I did ask Brian and Jamie if I could take a little liberty to start with and before I start my talk and just um, give a few shout outs, really, because I feel hugely privileged to be standing here, but there should be a whole raft of people with me because it's, you know, this is not work you do by yourself. You, there's a whole whole team of people. So, so first, I my core whānau, my core family, um, in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so thanks to them, um, especially to Linda Ojala um, and Lynn Silcock, who are my kind of UDL colleagues. And I know Linda is sitting in bed right now at silly o'clock um, on the live stream now. So, I, yeah, hooray for them. Um, and, um, yeah, go Linda. Um, and, and also, I, I, one doesn't often shout out for one's Ministry of Education. <laughs> um, but in our Ministry of Education, there is a tiny little team um, that has been there. There's been a few changes, but the, these three people that I am going to name check, that Judy, Sally, and Brian, have held the door open for us to, to create some national resources. And they've just really taken a punt um, and trust, trusted us. And it has been such an incredible journey. So, so big ups to them. Cheers. Cool. So, yeah. so here we go. Let's see if it's going to work. So this translating Universal Design for Learning, an Aotearoa New Zealand story. Um, yeah, yes. Um, and, and just to kind of um, a bit of extra info, Aotearoa is the indigenous name for New Zealand. Um, and probably I'll flip and flop with... Um, which name I use as we go, but I wanted you to know what it means. And it's, it's the name for the land of the long white cloud. And so to begin my talk this morning, I would like to um, kind of formally introduce myself. So no mai haere mai, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Kinder Scout te maunga, ko Uz te awa, no Ely, Cambridge, England, aho. Ko kaiko e core education tātai aharo ki poniki, ko Chrissy Butler toko ingoa. No reira tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. Hello. <laughs> Hello, you beautiful people. Um, so that that little introduction is kind of like a formal protocol that you often hear. Um, in, in New Zealand, and it's, it's a way to introduce yourself. It's about, you know, this is me, and this is the land that's important to me, and the people that are important to me. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's about connection. It's a protocol about connection. So for you in the room, an audience of people in the room, you're, you're listening to me and you're going, oh, what have we got in common? Can I trust her? Um, and can I trust her so actually we can work together? We can do some stuff and take some action. The, the, and the thing for me is I'm English, and I'm on quite a big journey finding my place in Aotearoa. Um, and one of those things about finding my place has been to learn how to introduce myself like that. Um, because uh, I think the protocol is really important, and also to use the first language um, of our first people and to honour that. The thing is, right now in the room, I don't think that there are many of you that speak Te Reo Māori. <laughs> okay, so the notion of this protocol being about connection, there's kind of like a 
possibly a missed opportunity. And the same, it would be the same in Aotearoa. In some context, they're, they're, you know, there's often not Māori speakers in the room. And so that little protocol created a beautiful opportunity for, for me to authentically introduce universal design for learning. Because in the spirit of um, multiple representations, I could go, well, actually, that's my mountain. That's the kinder scout that I just spoke of. It looks like that. And that's my awa, my river. Um, and this is the town where I grew up in Ely, the kind of place you only go on purpose. Um, and that joke rolls in New Zealand, too. <laughs> And this is my beautiful city of Wellington. So that's my hometown now. Um, this is my, my family, my Fano. And so the girl from England has got a wicked blended family and two Māori daughters. So, so two indigenous daughters amongst my three. So that's his own journey. Um, and then when I'm not doing um, this, I'm doing this. And, and again, it's a beautiful opportunity around universal design for learning. Because it's like, if I had said to you, oh, I'm in a band, you'd go, oh, yeah? <laughs> and if I said to you, I play the bass, you'd be like, oh, yeah? <laughs> and if I said to you, actually, I play in a rock band or even a punk band, I don't think this is what would be in your head. Right? So that whole notion of multiple representations to provide access and understanding, you know, it's cool. It works. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's playful. And I think in introducing UDL, um, in, certainly in, in, in our own country, that rolls really well. Um, I'm a class teacher by trade. Um, in primary, and I've worked in blind and low vision and um, national roles in, in um, technology. But one of the things that I've done more recently is been able to um, document um, young people and their families talking about uh, what works for them in school and what gets in the way. Um, and also with teachers, and also what, what do... Um, we, we heard David speak yesterday about these flexible learning environments. And actually, that's a huge thing in New Zealand. Um, our Ministry of Education is on basically looking at, at many, many schools across the country. And so we have these flexible spaces, the options, um, all, all over the country, in primary, in secondary. Yeah. And so part of my role for the last few years has been um, part of the team documenting that work and sticking it here. So the videos that Jamie talked about, and we've had opportunities to illustrate what universal design for learning looks like in our context, are sitting here. And I can share that with you later. So this translating um, UDL, an Aotearoa New Zealand story. Um, in about, in 2012, I had the opportunity to go to the UDL Symposium. And I met my hero, um, the wonderful David Rose. I've met him once. And at the end of the symposium, I got to pitch um, what I wanted to do when I went back to New Zealand. And I have to say, that's um, been a bit of a journey. Um, because trying to take that to the South Pacific, um, even to your community down the road, um, is, is quite a thing. It's quite a job of translation. Um, and, and I know for, for us, I think I can sum up um, the heart of our work 
with what I think of as guideline one. So engagement principle, access. Um, providing options for recruiting interest. How can we optimize relevance, value, and authenticity? And how do we minimize threats and distractions? That is the heart of my work. And I would punt, it is the heart of yours. With your schools and your communities, it's like, what is this UDL thing? What, why do we need to know? And so that, that's been our work. And so what I'd like to do is, um, is share, share with you a bit of the crunchy stuff. OK? So a couple of weeks ago, this um, beautiful teacher uh, and researcher um, said to me, and I was about to present a workshop, and she said, um, so are you going to come and tell us about how to be inclusive? You know, you're inclusive. With that kind of look. <laughs> right? And she's a beautiful, experienced Māori educator. But it re I really challenged me, because I thought, actually, am I, is that what I'm doing? Like, have I got this concept of my inclusive in my head, that my inclusive is somehow more superior to your inclusive? Um, and it really challenged me and got under my skin a bit. So I, I kind of had to think about, actually, how do I position universal design for learning? And so this is a photo of me in full flight, um, giving it a go. A a, and it was a new way of trying to explain. And so I want to just kind of share with you that. Um, and as I talk, if you've got a pen or a pencil, you might want to draw as I go. So imagine you've got two circles, OK? And so I just made them with streamers on the floor. And in one circle, you've got everything, all the research that we've got about effective practice, about teaching and learning, you know, research around accessibility, research around universal design, and also the research around um, the neuroscience. And, and really, that, that body of knowledge is what universal design for learning stands on. Yeah? That's our foundations are in that place. And, and the beauty of universal design for learning is that it has taken that knowledge with, the experience, with our experiences and set up a framework that supports us to plan for variability, to plan for equity, to plan so that learning works for everyone. OK? But when teachers see the, the, the framework, they'll often say, oh, I'm doing that already. Oh, I'm doing that already. And it's like, of course you are. You know, because it's the same body of knowledge. It's the same body of knowledge that John Hattie would talk about with visible thinking or Bloom's taxonomy or Solo. Or, it's the same stuff. But the beauty of the framework is it's about diversity. It helps us plan for equity. OK? The other thing to keep in mind is that circle actually is, I would suggest, based on a Western perspective, a Western and a kind of academic perspective. Now, let's look at the other circle. So if you imagine there's this other circle, and that holds another knowledge base, a knowledge base that is, um, is indigenous, and is based in, the play, in people and the land, and stories and histories and ancestors. It's, a, it's got a spiritual basis, an elemental basis, um, that's, that has sayings and beliefs and values, and beliefs and values about belonging, about being inclusive. So there's two knowledge bases there. And I think my, my, the teacher that kind of challenged me was my, I would find abhorrent that people would perceive that basically we're trying to impose UDL on top of people. That it's like, 
almost like colonization all over again. That there could be that perception. Okay, if you're, if you're an indigenous educator and the and UDL comes along and you already have these values and beliefs of your own, what might that feel like? And so somebody introduced me really recently to um, this idea of being a boundary worker. Okay, of actually recognizing the distinct bodies of knowledge and making that explicit. And I know for me, that's where I see my work. And, when I, and the way I introduced myself at the beginning is like an outworking of that. It's like an authentic example of universal des design in a kind of bicultural, inclusive context. Because, you know, I truly believe that, that universal design travels countries and continents and communities. It's relevant everywhere. But, it, but I also, and because in all those communities, there are learners and the learner variability is everywhere, okay? But there, there is a, I think we need a mindfulness about the way that we communicate that. Because we can learn both ways. Going back to that picture, you can see on the, on the foreground, there's a big piece of brown paper. Um, and so I don't know about you, but often when we're working with teachers and they get really enthusiastic about universal design for learning at a conceptual level, but the whole thing of actually getting in and doing it is like, that's a bit of a journey, you know, that, that implementation bit. So we went to Dr. Zeus. And my colleague Linda said, Do you know, when I'm working with teachers, I just need something where I could just go, look, just try an idea. Like, put it into UDL and, and then let's look at it and look at the look for the how we can build in flexibility and remove barriers, and then decide whether this is a good idea. And if it is, let's refine it and give it a go. Um, and so we made it on little cards as well. And to support the conversation, um, we took the guidelines um, and we made them into questions. It's so simple, but it's been, it's, it's been radical in people's response because all of a sudden it's a call to action. And most of the time, we've stuck with the same words because I was trying to help the transfer. But we have added one in. And the words will be unfamiliar to you, so that when the words are unfamiliar, it creates a little barrier. But we've said, how will this nurture Māori as tangata whenua? Tangata whenua is, is like the first people, our place, our land, OK? And New Zealand is a country that's been colonized. And countries that are colonized, um, the colonization is, you know, it's alive and kicking still. And the consequence is that marginalization um, of learners, and certainly our indigenous learners, have had a rough deal. I don't know what it's like for you, for the learners in your communities. Um, so we wanted to kind of help people to to join the dots, to keep thinking. Actually, how can we design something and support engagement um, so that young Māori learners can see themselves? So the approach of drawing it, the, the reason we did it the first time, or I did it the first time, was I was in a space and the, and the person leading the thing said, oh, there's no tech here. I was like, oh. OK. Uh, and I like to scribble a bit, so it was like, all right, we can do it like this. And um, the beauty of that picture is there's something that you can't see. So this is on a marae, so in an indigenous context, in a really rural part of New Zealand. And um, off screen are 
a number of people that live locally, and there's an 80-year-old lady who sat in on my session, because she could. <laughs> and she said to someone, and someone relayed, relayed it later, you know, that would work. Anybody could do that. That would work for anything. We could apply it to anything. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> It travels. So how can you help? We talk about we want this global UDL community, OK? We're in the South Pacific. We're probably, you know, we're a population in the middle of the ocean. On a map the other day in the leadership assembly, a map of the world, we weren't even there. But we're doing stuff, you know? And we want to help, but we need your help too. And so we invite you to make resources and materials that travel. And just a tiny example of what travels and what can get in the way. It can be really tiny. I had to look up block party on Wikipedia. <laughs> When I arrived at the airport, the lady at the information desk said, oh, just go to the crosswalk. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I had no idea. Until I went outside and I'm like, oh, the zebra crossing. <laughs> the pedestrian crossing. Oh, right, OK. Right? So think about when you're making stuff, how the language travels, your contexts that you set your examples in. And the last thing that I want to say is that let's be mindful of these boundaries and, and a spirit of honouring. Because my, I feel so privileged to have learnt my um, UDL in Aotearoa, New Zealand where I have had patient and kind and forgiving Māori colleagues who have let me learn in a, in a rich, cultural, indigenous context. And if, and if UDL is for everyone, everyone includes all our indigenous communities all over the world. All means everyone, OK? And so when we're iterating the next version of the guidelines, let's not just have the Western voices at the table. Let's get everyone contributing. Thank you.